In this next video, I want to begin to look at the plot of Genesis chapter 3 and the events that are described there from a literary perspective. But before I do, I'd like to reflect a little on what a plot is in literature, drawing from Ignacy Ribbo and his book on prose fiction, chapter two, on what is a plot. And you can download or open a copy of his book on prose fiction by going to the website at Open Book Publishers with Cambridge University. Aristotle is one of the first philosophers that we have a record of to have identified that human life is defined in terms of actions directed towards ends that can often be described in terms of a narrative. That is, we often make sense of our lives through the stories that we tell and participate in, which are events in time that lead towards particular ends or desires or needs that we're working towards and that deal with the challenges that we face in life's journey and resolve those challenges in various ways that are sometimes described in terms of history or story, sometimes in terms of comedy or tragedy, or sometimes in terms of resolution to the challenges that we face. Aristotle's Poetics describes ways in which, though history and factual descriptions are useful, but it's often the poets and the artists that get to the essence of what is going on, the essence and core meaning of what is going on through the use of imagination and metaphor rather than simply with description. And so in Aristotle's Poetics, the plot represents the life of actions that take place in terms of telling what took place, imagining and crafting a structure that communicates what takes place. And Aristotle suggested that every well-formed plot transitions from a beginning, setting, context, background, to a middle that deals with the themes and the issues and the crisis, and then to the end where it's resolved. So a plot moves through complications that it considers, that stretch from the beginning through to the decisive points where they're worked through, and then towards difficulties and a solution, the end point, the denouement, in which the strands of the plot are drawn together, the matters are explained, resolved or left unresolved in meaningful ways. Plato, however, in his attempt to design a just society, warned of the dangers of these literary approaches. And he wanted to banish the poet and the plot from the ideal republic to stick with the facts. And many modernists would like to do the same today. An imitation was three times or a third removed from the truth. That is a copy that artists were describing or painting or dramatically presenting is a weak inferior copy in relationship to the model of the original. And to imitate is to engage in an activity as derivative, second rate, peripheral uh, to the important business of life, says Elizabeth Bellapore in Tragic Pleasures, Aristotle on Plot and Emotion. But I don't think Plato was totally against plot or narrative. That is, he was against the dangers that can occur through a narrative if it gets too far away from the truth. And if the narrative, as Aristotle shows, was able to communicate truth in a deeper way, then I'm sure that Plato would agree with that approach. The most common elements of a narrative, according to Aristotle, include the plot, that is the way we describe what is taking place, and then the recreation that takes place often in the mind of the reader, the mimesis. That is, we repicture the plot that's presented to us in the drama or artistic work or story. And then the release, the catharsis towards the end of the presentation of the plot, when the problem is resolved, an, an aha moment where we feel satisfied that we have finally discovered um, what was the entire meaning the story. And also the wisdom, the phrenesis that's communicated through the story. What can we learn from the story that's presented to us? And the ethics or ethos 
um, that is presented um, and the moral uh, reflection that we can be satisfactorily reflecting on at the end of the story in order to interpret the creative texts, which fall under the task of hermeneutics, communication of the meaning of the narrative. The elements of the narrative begin with the plot, the mythos, it begins with the setting, uh, the presentation, and then the um, issue, the theme, the crisis and the resolution of the crisis. And then this is presented so that in the mind of the reader, there's a recreation, a mimesis, um, as the reader moves through uh, time and reflects on what it all means. Then we have the re release, the catharsis towards the end of the story, the wisdom, the reflection, the phronesis, what is meant by the message of the story and the ethics that is how do we apply it ethically to our own lives. The essence or edos of our lives is what Aristotle calls the recreation of the mimesis. The essence is how we reflect on what is being presented and how it is to be worked out in our life and world. It highlights the potential truths of this world and it reenacts the real world of action by magnifying the essential traits. The frame of existence is best redefined or narrated through the means of verbal recounting and there there's a recreation um, of the plot. In this regard, the passage um, reads, mimesis is partly invention within our mind and our thoughts as readers. Um, that is, it discovers, it creates, um, and in short, it recreates the actual worlds that we've read about as possible worlds in our mind and before us. The release or catharsis refers to a purging um, of uh, that which is not right and a resolution of that which is true. It calls for the play of free imagination to know what it feels like to be in someone else's head, shoes or skin, the head, shoes or skin of the characters in what we read about. And this cathartic release is very important in scripture as we read the narratives and stories, work through the problems, think about the issues, and then seek a solution. Cathartic release involves the emotions as well as the mind and thinking. And it's these emotional commitments that often leads us to hold on to stories more strongly than we hold on to simple instruction. The emotions involve pity, uh, concern, fear, as one tends to relate the central elements of the story to our own lives. What would it be like if we were going through the same challenge or issue? And as we read in Genesis chapter 3, the narrative of um, uh, uh, Adam and Eve and the challenges that are faced with the serpent and with the choice over the fruit and knowledge of good and evil, and then we go on to chapter four and we uh, read about Cain and Abel. We, we get a feeling for what it would be like if we were there in that narrative and story as well. Elizabeth Costello says, the heart is the seat of faculty, sympathy. It allows us to share at times the being of another. There are people who have a capacity to imagine themselves as someone else. There's no limit to the extent that we can think ourselves into the being another. There's no bounds to the sympathetic imagination. And uh, neuroscientists have described um, the way in which the mirror neurons in our mind uh, tend to activate as we read and think about another person going through a situation so that we begin to feel the pain that they feel. We begin to sense the challenges that they sense. And then at the end of the story, there's the therapeutic element, um, the power to heal, and we feel and experience the sense of resolution if it's well presented in the story. The creation of a narrative is like a spell which makes it, um, the impossible seem as though it's possible and uh, sustains our interest, our curiosity. This element is known as the literary belief, and it's essential to make narratives 
incredible. And so as we read biblical narratives of hope, we get a sense of the hope that's presented. And uh, often this is a realistic hope, but it's a hope that goes beyond that which we're seeing in our imagine, uh, immediate future. And so we can read of David and Goliath and we can think we face Goliaths in our own life. And so we can get a sense of hope that though we can't immediately see the solutions, we believe that there are solutions ahead for us. A good story and a good Bible story has the power to transform. Stories offer us some of the richest and most enduring insights into the human condition. And there's two types of human condition. There is firstly the human condition to achieve much more than we would immediately think, to be better uh, about ourselves and in life than we would immediately think. Uh, children can grow into adults who can achieve great things. Uh, people who've fallen can get up again and achieve much more. And then there is the other side of the human condition, that is knowing good and evil, that is knowing that we can achieve good, we realise that we can also turn that around and uh, do that which is evil. Uh, knowing that we can um, work hard and achieve possessions, we realise that, that we could also take possessions from others, uh, knowing uh, that we can uh, know love, uh, between one person and another, we realise that love can be twisted in various ways. And so um, scholars such as Augustine in 400 AD uh, often spoke of evil in terms of the absence of good, the distortion of good. And so for every element of good that we're able to know and participate in and the greater our powers of uh, knowledge, the greater the capacity to turn good around. Um, and to remove good and to do evil. Stories offer us some of the richest and most enduring insights into these human conditions. And Richard uh, Canini, in 2002, in his book on stories, presents a clear, compelling style uh, as to why narrative has a power to communicate these truths to us. Drawing on the work of James Joyce, Sigmund Freud, uh, Oscar Schindler, and he, uh, skillfully illuminates how stories not only entertain, they can shape our lives, our sense of destiny and identity. Um, and so even nations are attracted to stories such as Romulus and Remus in the founding of Rome or in the biblical narrative from Abraham through to David, we have the founding of a nation of Israel that continues to speak to that nation today. And other nations, as we've drawn uh, North America, Australia, partly on biblical narratives and Western interpretations of these narratives, often um, will use these stories in various ways to shape our national hopes. An author who um, presents a story is often communicating ethics um, and stories make possible an ethical sharing of the common world that we live in um, and the challenges that face the unethical activity that can present itself and the ways in which these ethics can be dealt with in terms of both justice but also in terms of forgiveness and grace that can be shown and transformation that can occur. The act of storytelling involves a teller presenting story or narrative of real worlds or imaginary worlds to listeners um, at the receiving end who may be listeners in the narrative or story or also us as uh, hearers or readers who uh, hear the story presented to us and it activates mimesis or imitation of the story in our minds and we think through what it means uh, to us. And the author in their storytelling um, can, uh, in fact, communicate a romantic ideal, which many of us are attracted to, uh, or existential engagement with the big questions of existence, whether it be a faith-filled existentialist like uh, Soren Kierkegaard, um, who presents to us 
um, the challenge of reflecting on eternal existence um, for thousands of years past and future, and so that our lives of 70 to 80 or 90 years have meaning in the meaning of eternal existence, or uh, uh, nihilists or other um, uh, types of existentialists who are non-theistic existentialists who say that our life has no meaning in terms of longer time periods, or uh, agnostics who say that uh, they can't uh, see whether life has uh, meaning or no meaning because they have insufficient information. As a, as a Christian, I'm attracted to uh, existential hope that says that existence does have meaning in the mind and purposes of the one who gave us the world around us, God himself. And uh, so storytellers may tap into these big themes, big worldviews, um, or um, some storytellers that may have a more pragmatic, realistic uh, approach to e existence. Some storytellers uh, may come from one particular background or another, and they seek to communicate um, that um, uh, smaller dimension of the big picture. Structuralists will often focus on the linguistic and other structures that give meaning to the story, and post-structuralists will say that they want to move beyond these fixed structures that have uh, been um, erected by our cultures and societies. Materialists and realists will often focus on this world, whereas idealists will often focus on ideal worlds that stretch beyond this world. And I'm intrigued that many philosophers, rather than being um, restricted and focused on the materialist and the realist, uh, many philosophers will be idealists and that they'll see that there are ideal realms that are beyond our present uh, material, present day uh, realities. That is, they see a house and rather than saying that the um, uh, house can be measured in terms of its size, um, uh, there is an existence before that house um, developed an idealism. Um, in the mind of architects who uh, drew up the plans for the house and in the minds of the owners of the house that had certain purposes. And so that much of reality um, exists in the ideals. Um, in a platonic uh, realm described by Plato rather than in the more empiricist realm as described by Aristotle. So hermeneutics seeks to interpret the ways in which a narrative is being communicated and it seeks to then communicate that narrative to others. So narratives do much more than tell a story. Um, in summary, narratives also communicate ethics and ethical values of the author through the text of the story and in the minds of the reader. In biblical narratives, we often have the um, ethical concept not fully spelled out for us, but challenging us in ways in which all of the answers are given. And so when we come to uh, Genesis 3 um, with the temptation, we're not told if the uh, serpent is uh, doing the wrong thing. Thing. We're not given a great deal of details about that. We're caught up in the midst of the story. And it's this very lack of detail that uh, gives us freedom and opportunity to think more deeply about what it means to us. So as has been uh, said by Ulbrich, the um, uh, narrative is fraught with a lack of detail. And it's that very teaching educational method of the ancient Hebrews that challenges the reader to think more deeply about what does this narrative mean for us? What does the temptation of Eve as she looks at the fruit and sees that it's good to the eyes, good to the taste, and that the knowledge of good and evil would make her to be like God and the gods? What does that mean to us today as we face uh, temptations? How would we respond and act? And how do we deal with the 
failures and weaknesses and temptations in our life. And then in um, Genesis 3, we go on to have uh, God. Um, firstly, humans try to clothe themselves with um, uh, vegetation, but then God uh, provides the skins of animals which have required a sacrifice of the animals to um, then uh, give the skins to the humans to cover themselves. It's a reminder that God is willing to go through sacrifice, that God is willing to cover over um, uh, that which gets in the um, way of the difficulty. And so that uh, there is a demonstration of grace, a demonstration of redemption, a, a demonstration of opportunity for forgiveness and uh, moving on that we'll see unfolds through the rest of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, particularly through um, the Gospels and Jesus and the presentation of uh, more clearly and strongly the message that God loves us and had good purposes for us and he's willing to come amongst us and his son is willing to die for us to bring us into the fullness of life salvation that's when the um, story narrative of genesis comes together but it really only comes together um, in a meaningful way when we reflect on the meaning of this story and what it means for us to see the challenge of temptation for us to see the challenge of sin and fallenness and for us to see the hope of restoration that's presented here and for us to begin to take that on board. Uh, really, the narratives of the Bible aren't for us to examine so much, um, but for us to listen to, for us to come under the word of God to us and to apply that and to allow God to apply it in our lives, just as in that Genesis uh, 3, God takes the skins of animals and provides them. And um, Adam and Eve, what they can really do is simply receive that provision from God and allow God to cover over their failures and weaknesses and to lead them on into a better life. That's the way in which narratives uh, work um, they communicate truths to us through the images that are presented. And then uh, they give us an opportunity to respond in various ways to those truths in life transforming ways. These narratives of the Bible are powerful. They have shaped humanity. They have uh, influenced people's lives. They've brought many people to an experience of change and transformation, being forgiven and finding hope and salvation that's communicated through these narratives. I encourage you now to reflect more deeply on the nature of narratives and the way